Can you guys tell me the name of the last books that you read by black authors? I can't. Whenever I read a book, I just, I don't know what the ethnicity is of the author that I'm reading. I'm not that person who reads the jacket. Harriet Tubman? Honestly, I can't remember. Because um, I don't look at, at who writes the books. I get some of my um, desired reads or what's popular out of like our, our black magazines, like our Essence and our Ebony's. You know, some of those magazines have put in little editors areas where, you know, new books that are happening or whatever. Yeah, like, no. I don't, I don't recall any. I can tell you the authors that I tend to read. Stephen King, Dean Koontz. I'm reading Game of Thrones. Um, but I think they all have a common factor that they're all white authors. How uncomfortable is this? <laughs> Poems never published, stories never told. Tribute to the Black Writers Conference. Forever staining the eyes of American readers. They who created volumes while hiding from cobalt corners. After book burnings. Sacrifice of knowledge in a maniacal dance. Their pens were arched in jagged arrows, dipped in the poisonous ink of racial violence, calligraphic insignia of stories erased by fear and time. Better not catch you reading. Better not catch you writing. To a slave, paper was more valuable than a Sunday dress. A poem was worthy of the beating she took for styling it. I'm telling truth here. A Negro writer's last request, bury me with my pen and breast pocket. I'm going to keep writing after I'm gone. Parchment, paper, paper, and journal accounts of lynchings, rapes, tar and feathers, establishment of a free press. And what are the stolen stories? Authorship denied, plagiarism claimed by a jealous master. Their words have become water. My eyes, lips, and ears, they're sure, swimming their history into minds, rattling like empty vessels who only learned Columbus, Lincoln, maybe post-slavery in a high school classroom. I'm writing truth, y'all. I ain't writing so folks will like me. This is for the manuscripts trapped in terrorized minds and poems that were never published, never even written down. A living, speaking, monument for the stories and the legacies of black writers that will never, ever be told. Tell me your thoughts about black literature and where it is today from a public standpoint, what's out in the store being picked up every day? I struggle with what's being picked up every day in the store. I think there's some segregation in it, maybe not overtly, but uh, for me, I know some people don't like it. I don't like the African American section. I, I just don't. I don't like it. I feel that we're all authors. So, and there, even if you just put a, a black model on the cover, automatically you're an African American author and you're labeled in that section, that's what I don't like. I don't understand the segregation of, you know, here's the African American section, go crazy if you want to go find black authors. It's like, you know what, I'm an author, I just happen to be black, I have this voice. It's a little disappointing. Uh, a lot of the books that I see in those particular places uh, are, I guess they're considered urban fiction. 
Um, I understand they're entertaining, but uh, I look for more books with depth that have an underlying meaning to it, something that's uh, going to uplift the black community a little bit more. You're missing the writers that wrote in such a way there was such depth and patience they really took their time they really brought you into this world um, you know Ralph Ellison the Invisible Man it's just you know it takes its time it unfolds the mentality of this generation is much more immediate gratification so you gotta you have to have to hit it and I actually um, for my first book understood that and tried to use that to my advantage. I think as an author I have the we all have the luxury of not being happy with what we see <laughs> so we get to write our own version um, so I think that you know my writing reflects the fact that I think that there's only one story being told about us um, one story being told about our men, one story being told about our women. Um, and so I don't like that. So I'm writing about different kinds of women who have different issues and different um, dreams, you know, different goals. Some of it troubles me. And I guess I said I was an old school writer for the purpose of I, I understand and I respect the passion and the depth of the intellect of the writing. And sometimes today we don't see that necessarily when you go to the checkout stores or you go to the, the Walmarts or whatever, the book covers themselves tell you a story that may not be as respectful of African American people as I would want to be in my writing. So I just, um, I guess that's why I respect even more so the, the writers of old and it's nothing against those who are out there now. There's some very good respectable ones. I just. I think we have to be more conscious as black people how we represent ourselves. And I'm not down on the genre, even with street lit. Some of it, it is fine, but the majority of it, it I think it has a negative impact on the community because of the, the way it's written. And uh, maybe the language, sometimes language is needed to get a point across sometimes, but I think the way that it, it's used in some of the street lit, it, I don't think it's necessary. So I think it's the author's responsibility to, you know, if you're going to use it, make it effective. I have a lot of feelings about the material out there today, but what to me what's most important is that there's something out there for everybody. You know, there was a time where information wasn't really produced for us because they didn't think that we read it. it there was, there was no concern about putting material out that was for us, about us, by us, and that's just from an African American perspective. So I came to the conference and I began to meet people who are not published in a traditional setting, and I'm looking at the stats and I'm looking at the options and the stories that they're writing, and then I'm meeting these kind of underground people that are just hustling to get their message out, and I'm realizing there's another voice, there's another side, there's another angle, and there's another way to get it done. And there are what I call the powers that be that are going to pay for what they want to see on the shelves. And they're going to pay for the images that they want to see. I don't believe we have to subscribe to that. And I believed if we stopped writing it, you know, some would say, well, if we stopped writing it, we wouldn't have any voice. I don't know. We'd have a voice. It might just be in our community. But is that a bad thing? I guess the, the other component of that, which is really sad, is um, the urban fiction. I, the messages and images that are tied to erotica, urban fiction, and even some Christian fiction, because some Christian fiction is, are things like, you know, the preacher is my baby's daddy. You know, it's kind of like, it's not the pause, some of it's not the positive Christian fiction. And so you have these kind of problematic images, I think, and messages about African Americans that are being promoted by the industry during a time when, I mean, I think that we need a balance. We need, you know, a variety of different images and messages. And I call that the Terry McMillan syndrome. What does that mean? And all the publishers wanted the next Terry McMillan. Get me that next Terry McMillan. And when they did that, they 
signed and produced people that had very skeleton and flimsy storylines. But the recurring theme was a black woman in power with friends, questionable men on a journey through life. And because they had that framework, they expected to produce another blockbuster. But what happened was, was a watering down of literature. And when you water down literature and then it doesn't sell, then that actually, from a parallel standpoint, gives a negative connotation of what a black author is. A lot of black authors assume that it's only happening in black publishing, and that's not true. When most of the stuff that they complain about is really happening in cross publishing across the board. And even with African American titles, we're way ahead of like Hispanic writers and stuff. They're still, you know, struggling. Whereas now, you know, the black publishing has exploded. It really has, but we had like conferences and the African American Pavilion at the Book Expo America, all that kind of stuff. You think about it, the Asian writers, they don't have that. The Hispanic writers, they don't have that. And so the things that we complain about, like I hear a lot of black authors complain about there being African American sections in certain bookstores. What they don't understand is they don't have that for Asian writers and for Hispanic writers and stuff. So it's almost like they need to be grateful that we even had that. Urban fiction is popular among African Americans because a lot of those African Americans started to self-publish. And at one point, 2005 to 2008, African Americans in the publishing space were being held down by urban fiction stories. That's what Barnes & Noble was buying. That's what the publishers were buying. So it was booming. At this point, it's, it's watered down. There's more uh, quantity and less quality. So that's not necessarily something. If somebody was like, I want to become an author today, I'm not recommending that they write urban fiction. Maybe before we weren't allowed, particularly as African American, maybe we weren't allowed to try and pursue uh, the, uh, the the likes of Hughes and James Baldwin type of, you know, maybe, eh, 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 but this won't sell. I'm sorry, it won't sell. You know, now we go, okay, I've got, I've got my own power and, and they don't see it. But I'm going to go and I'm going to do it because I believe I have something to say. But as a whole, I would love to see us in the forefront. When we go to bookstores, I would like to see just books, not just an African-American session. And some people like that. But why can't it be just books just across the board? That's what I would like to see. I've had this discussion and I've had it with the actual owners of some of these chains. And they try to figure out the best way to sell the books. So they're not trying to exclude us or harm us in any, in any way by having those separate sections. It actually does help to sell the books. So I, I do suspect that we get more scrutiny. I suspect that we get put on the last shelf uh, the last thing to possibly read. I suspect there's even income disparity. There is in the, every other um, category. So I would suspect that when you get a lot of money to write your book, mm -hmm. I think that we probably get less. Less money, the publishers don't want to continue to put resources behind it. Now what you'll have is you'll have people that'll see, you know, these these one-hit wonders, um, other author, uh, white authors mainly, mainstream authors, and they'll say, well, see, they're getting all of this publicity and they're getting all of this marketing budget, but they don't see the thousands and thousands of other white authors that are not. And it's not just with African-American books either, that's with any kind of books. If mysteries all of a sudden become really, really successful, then all the publishers start looking for, you know, a great mystery writer. If if it's um, romance and all of a sudden it's hot, that's what they're looking for. And just like with the recent Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, now their publishers are looking for more, you know, white erotica and stuff, even though it's always been there. You know, so they do tend to jump on that trend. Every single one of my 25 books is still in print. The majority of white authors, they got a year, two, maybe three, and then their books have gone out of print and on to the next book. And often they'll say, well, shouldn't we have a white character or shouldn't we make sure that the market is more diverse than it is? And maybe in some cases that might be true, but in other cases I think we really do need to focus on us. 
but I think it's the authors, it's our community that really needs to be more vocal about we need to hear our voices, we need to hear more than just what's out there now. I think what has to happen is we need to recognize, we need to realize that if we don't support our own, nobody else is going to do it for us. If an African American woman has a long day at work, she has kids, she has to help them with the homework, take them to ballet, swimming, all that kind of stuff, and she even has an opportunity to go into a bookstore, she wants to be able to go right to one section and be able to find what she's looking for. She doesn't have time to be in there for two or three hours, that kind of thing. And here's why. You, you know, people, I have some friends that are totally against that. But you have to change your mentality first. Because you take my book with my black person on the cover and you put it in the mainstream section because it's for everybody. That's the whole mentality. Then my book is for everybody, so it should be over here with everybody. Well, you put it over there. You've essentially eliminated my core audience who doesn't want to go through the whole, whole rigmarole of searching a bookstore for me. And now you're hoping that you can change the mindset of a white consumer who sees my name and knows it's a black book, which that has happened. Because I've been in both segment sections. I've been in the mainstream section and I've been in African-American section. I sell far more books in the African-American section. You can find um, African-American contemporary fiction stories on the shelves. You just have to know the title and the author and, and where to look. But the the majority, because so many are putting that type of work out, they just group it all together and say, okay, let's set up an urban fiction display on African American display. If the last 10 books that came out from a publishing company happen to be erotica and urban fiction, then that's what they're gonna put on a display because those are the newest releases. I definitely think that the value of black writing in the publishing industry, that there are different standards for the value of black writing. And I think a piece of that is our own value that we have of our experiences. And I think that the publishing world mirrors how we feel about our experiences. And the fact that we only tell two or three types of stories and that, you know, we don't value the rich, you know, cultural backdrop of our own lives, of our own experiences, I think that directly relates to the value that the publishing world has on our stories, on our writing. I know that art imitates reality, so to a certain degree it's the author, what they, the story that they want to tell, but then at the same time the publisher is saying we've got to make some money here. So how do you spin it in a way that gets more readers without losing yourself in the truth of who you are? I think the challenge of the gatekeeper mentality, that New York mentality of old editors that don't have any connection to African-American experience, um, and they are the gatekeepers of modern literature. <laughs> so that doesn't make any sense to me. So I find that to be hard to work with. You know, I mean, I know that the publisher can block the gate if they don't agree with what you're saying, but I, I feel like it's both. I'm, I'm responsible for what I wrote, you know, and then if you're saying through this traditional system there's no room for me, then I have to go a different route in order to protect the voice or the integrity behind the message that I originally said I believed in. You know, if what you're saying matters, then I still have to own it on some level, which takes a lot of extra effort, but, you know, we're going somewhere. We're building a fire and we want it to last a long time past us. So then you have to put that extra effort in if the message matters. You start seeing what people are hungry for. You start seeing what they're really, really hungry for. Not what the keepers of the gate tell you. Because that's an interpretation, and a lot of times that's an interpretation of a community that they don't really know. And they're gonna, they'll tell you what, what the people are hungry for. But when you walk amongst the people and you see what they're eating, <laughs> you're like, that's not what they, they're, they're eating this stuff up. I, I said I wanted to present this type of meal and the keepers at the gate said, oh no, no, no way, they will never eat that. And you go, oh, okay, well then you have a party and you cook this, you make this meal and people are going crazy over it. And then you bring that meal on the road and you bring it to someone else's event and they're eating it. 
that's the same thing. So, you know, I'm glad we don't have, I'm glad we're not allowing people to define us and say, hey, listen, if you don't write Christian, urban, or erotica, um, you know, black, um, there's, there's no place for you. Okay. I disagree with that. The perception is um, that urban fiction, Christian fiction, and erotica are the only three things that agents are buying. Okay. So you tell us. Not not us. Not I mean not not me. Like it's so funny. Those three, I'm like, no, no, and no. I was told, literally, literally point blank, white agent, the because of the recession and everything, you know, it, things were really tight and the only books that the industry was looking for at that time, and, and my understanding is it's true now, Christian fiction, urban fiction, and erotica. Certain authors are getting the deals, so those authors are getting the deals, they have that 12 book deal, so you're going to get 12 books, probably about the same stuff, and that's what we're forced to read. So I think, I think at the end of the day, the author, author's, a writer's going to write, period, the end, we know that. What about who knows? But it's those marketing engines, it's those, the powers that be that say, you know what, let's let this be what it is, and this is the stuff that they want to read, this is what they do every Sunday, and all of that good stuff. At the end of the day, they're the ones that's behind it. But we are in a position now where we can change that. If you are an African-American author, of course, if you want to make your characters black, that's totally acceptable and it makes sense. But let your story be something mainstream that any person of any nationality can pick it up and the story can still be relevant if they change the characters to Asian, Latina, or Caucasian. I think the problem is, is our little circle is so saturated, so small, and theirs is so large. So we hear those success stories and we think more and more of them are getting book deals. I will say that there are a lot of authors who are so desperate to get a book deal, which I was not, that they end up signing really bad contracts and really, they do put themselves in bad situations. But the detriment to me is not to have a balance, you know, for them to publish those kinds of books and then not publish other books that are more um, positive and prominent. I also wonder if you have Crackhead 1, do we really need Crackhead 2? But that's a whole nother issue. <laughs> so people complain a lot. I don't write urban fiction, but people complain a lot about urban fiction. It's this, it's that, it's not real fiction. It's what, whatever it is, urban fiction has people reading who never used to pick up books. So then guess what? People don't want to purchase black books written by quote-unquote black authors, which is tragic in and of itself from a macro standpoint. Um, because if you look at it micro, you say, okay, well, people were signed. Well, signed to what? What did they sign away? The integrity and power of good writing? bad news is everyone can do it and when everyone can do it it's going to be there's going to be such an influx of mediocrity not everybody needs to hold a pen in their hands <laughs> not everybody you know what I mean once the, the playing field was leveled by technology anybody and everybody can write a book but I also believe that just like anything else it's things get sifted out, and then what remains is what's true. We must address the digital divide. We must address um, our hesitancy and disconnect to where technology is going, and that we must get on the cutting edge of where technology is going and forge our way, and if we have to, bully our way into the digital industry. It also allowed more um less talented authors. It allow anybody with an inkling to write a book. And so you get a lot of crap, if you will. And what happens then, the reader becomes a lot more discerning. So it can be great in that they can get their, their um, books out. It can be um, 
a drawback in that the reader is more discerning. The reader is like, okay, I've had a lot of crap. I don't, I don't know that I want to take a chance on a new author. You know, with technology, you know, self-publishing is becoming more is becoming easier and, and to be honest with you, more profitable. Um, the industry is expecting authors to do a lot more in promotion and marketing and editing than they've ever had to do before. And so some people are arguing, well, if I have to do all of that, why would I give you 80% and I'm only keeping 20 or, or 90% and I'm keeping 10? The industry overall is actually in a good place for authors. They may not see that because, you know, bookstores are closing. Oh, where can I go with my book? But with social media, you can put out your own messages. You can reach your readers and never leave the comfort of your own home because of social media. So technology has made it easier for authors to promote and communicate to their readers. And I really think that any author that's not using social media in some way, you know, whether it's YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace still, um, to connect with their readers doing blogging, they're doing themselves a disservice because technology actually has changed the publishing climate to now authors are in control and then the publishers are now following behind in, in the trend so you know once again it goes back to doing the research but if authors are participating in social media and know what's out there and take advantage of that they actually are in the driver's seat you know look we all want the big publishing deal the big fat advance of course let's, let's not get it twisted you know um, but you know as our parents used to say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So um, now, you know, what, what they don't tell you is that the same publishers that turn down people, they, they still keep an eye on what they're doing as being self-published. And when they start hitting certain numbers, all of a sudden, the same people that said no are now interested. So now people were producing their own stuff and self-publishing in like the late 90s. But once 2000 came around, by the time you got to the mid 2000s, it got to a point where it took nothing to publish a book on your own. But now you but you you open it up to to everyone and as as it should be, you know. But with that, you have to also understand that there's the, the, the quality decreases because you have, you know, you have a bunch of idiots in there that's, oh, I can do this, I can write this book, and you go, oh my God, it's, you know, that's why the majority of self-published books are horrible. I want to just make up a word and say that the ignitizing, I don't know if that's a word, but I think that, you know, with the advent and the development and, and of technology, and the uh, instant gratification culture that is also being promoted and embraced and birthed among you know our youth that a piece of it is that you know books are almost becoming a different entity it's like a book is you know it's not even like you know something that we that is tangible anymore why in the hell are we going for the obvious story why are we writing the obvious story? We need to go deeper. We need to go forward and think more. And I think that's one of the things that's going to open up our readership, have white people read in our books, because it's not just about the black church, the preacher, who the preacher has slept with, who the woman is that's coming to the church, and who whatever it is that's going on in the church or whatever it is going on in a sexual relationship with a woman trying to get a man or whatever. We're deeper than that. There's more to us than just the church and sex. We got to do better. You know, the technology gives us the power. My belief is this. That power in the right hands is awesome. We worry so much about crossing over. I would love to cross over, but how about we let them cross over to us? There was a time in Hollywood when you could just say, I have this idea, uh, double O soul. They're like, oh, I like it. Uh, what's your, your attorney's uh, number? They didn't even hear that, that what the movie was about. It seems like it's still a cottage industry, and I think that black authors don't know what to do. They don't know uh, how to make the connect, and I believe that just like anything else in the Hollywood industry, um, you have to make your connections by knowing people. Then came the time 
when you say Double O Soul, oh, well, what's the movie about? And then you explain it. And they go, oh, wow, well, I like that. What's your turn to tell me? Just as black people, we do a good job with our creativity and, and how we, I definitely believe that when it comes to self publish authors, African Americans stand out in a major way just because they're fearless. But I want them to take that fearlessness and start getting professional advice so that the product that you're putting out in your fearlessness actually is the best product. Then came a time when you say, uh, a double O song. Oh, what's it about? Oh, can you write a treatment? Yeah, turn in a treatment. What's your turn to? As a producer, um, there have been so many times that I've gone to studios and networks and pitch projects and they were like, wow, that's a great idea. And they would ask me two questions. Man, that's a great idea. Is it true? Or is it based on a book? Though that 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 those two elements seem to elevate what they already acknowledged was a good idea. But this made it a great idea if it was if it was true or if it was based on a book. Then came a time when you said, double oh, so. Oh, what's it about? You tell them. Can you write a treatment? Oh, I like it. Can you write the screenplay? Can you write the screenplay? So ultimately what it comes down to is the quality of the work, in my opinion. I don't think that with movies, of course, you know, it's like, oh, if it's the bestseller, of course it's gonna get a little bit more attention. But the other problem that most writers don't think about is most movie executives are not going to sit there and read a bunch of novels. The first thing they need to do is write a script. Hey, come on, so. You tell me about it? You're in treatment? You write a screenplay? Then it's, can you shoot a couple of scenes? It get harder. To the point now, nobody's really making any movies in Hollywood. You look at the movies that are being made, most of them are independent film. As far as um, the erotic world, like the Zanes of the world, I think that um, they feel, when I say they, meaning uh, the Hollywood executives, feel like that is something that sells. It's a big idea to want to write a book, and it's a big idea to try to get that book turned into a film. That we had a gentleman in our group who had produced a video. Uh, well, his book had gone to the movies, but he was very clear that what the movie industry wanted him to do was to have more sex scenes, more profanity, uh, more things that he would not normally have put in his books. And I think that's what we're told sells, but I'm not sure that that's true. And kind of how, how did you jump ship? basically. You know, I got um, I got my film deal. I wasn't looking for my film deal. I wrote a good book. And the book did well because it's not just about writing the book. It's about marketing the book as well. And so the book caught the attention of Juanita Bynum, um, the minister, and she took the book to Hollywood. She wanted to know if I would allow her to take the book to Hollywood. And I said, do you want me to drive you? But she took the book to Hollywood, caught the attention of, of a producer there. I signed a one seven film deal that didn't pan out in the world of options, um, did not pan out. And I ended up um, getting with Regina King, who took it to BET. And so it, it, had been, it has been a long journey, but it is one that is definitely worth it. The whole experience was phenomenal. For me, being a part of the movie, filming, the producing, all of it was just an experience that I just will never, ever forget. Because one of the things you see a lot in Hollywood is they buy a book from an author and they tell them, see you, maybe at the premiere. But BET, Regina King, Roll Ties Production, Queen Latifah's Flavor Unit, are, there are producers on it. They all allowed me to be there. And for an author, that is just a phenomenal experience. Hollywood industry tries to, uh, you know, put us into one uh, particular category. And I think it's an unfair uh, gesture on their behalf. When I say they're meaning the, the, the producers and, you know, the gatekeepers is what I call them. I think that they see you as one thing and they think that that's all you can do. And after a while, you become slightly brainwashed into thinking that that's what I am. I can only do that or that's the only thing that they're going to accept from me. But I think that if you're a writer, then you write. If you want to be a writer, just write. You're not, maybe you're not going to get an office when you start writing your first book.
Maybe you're not going to get a, 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 a deal at Simon & Schuster. Maybe, you know, just write. That's all you have to do. But right now, that Fly Girl book, man, every single day, I'm going to grab my phone right now, and it's going to be good. So, oh, Fly Girl is my favorite book. It got me every single day of my life. And they all want the film deal done. And, of course, I keep saying, look, I have no Hollywood money. I've been out to Hollywood for the last 15 years, and I hear the same old thing. They don't have capital for it. And Fly Girl is a young urban woman's vehicle. First thing Hollywood asks is, who can we get to play this star that's going to get our money back? Can we throw Rihanna in the movie? Even though she may not fit what we need. But, you know, so they're looking at what star can, And that ruins the whole movie. They won't do their movies that way. They will have a casting call and find 100 white girls and then select a white girl that fits. They won't let us do that, though. You got to be already popular because they want to sell tickets from the door. You got to basically sell the investor on whoever you're going to put in the movie. And so immediately I tell young girls, it's hard because the first thing they're going to ask me is, who's going to sell this movie? Right? If we're looking at some unknown black girl, Spike Lee used to be able to do that. Where he had all these brand new black people that he would march in one of his Spike Lee joints and then it became popular. Now, we can't do that anymore. It has to be an all-star cast, or if it's not an all-star cast, you're terrified that it won't do well. But they would do well, they just don't allow us that opportunity. Um, whenever there's a, you know, any kind of conference like uh, the ABFF, uh, absolutely uh, black authors, authors of, of all races should be there, but primarily black authors should be there to look at the opportunities that could present themselves more than anything, people have to like you in this business, in the publishing uh, business and in the film business. If people don't like you, you can be really talented, especially here in Los Angeles, because people come here from all over the world, talented people. And so you have to compete against all these people. So if people don't like you, there's too many other people to choose from. So you have to work on yourself. You have to you know, uh, know how to present yourself. Uh, one of the things I like to tell authors, new authors, is the main difference between you and me is that I get mine down on paper. <laughs> the, I think the most important advice that I can give to an aspiring author is to write. And that may sound simple, but what I get from a lot of people is, I work a full-time job, and then I have kids, and then there's my husband. I just don't have the time to write. I just, you know, I want to write, and I've got this book in me, but I just don't. And I just look, and I let them finish. And they say, well, what would you tell me? The same thing I would tell anybody. Just write. Because the more excuses you make, the more barriers you are putting up in order to not get this done. And so if you just write, then you'll look up one day and guess what? You'll be done because you've been writing. So sit and write. It's just that simple. We have to do our homework because I see, you know, so many young writers coming out. They haven't done that homework. You know, they don't see the importance of a good editor, you know, a good line editor, a co you know, copy editor. And so we have to do that work and invest in nurturing this, the writer's spirit in ourselves. How can I maybe produce some characters that are interesting, that might draw people in, but at the same time teach some facts that we need to know as, as people? But I think what a lot of people want is prestige. And it may not be uh, prestigious enough for some people. They want to be really accepted by the establishment, by the publishing world. And so when you have a deal uh, Simon & Schuster or William Morrow or Harper Collins, um, and, and you tell people, you know, my dear, I owe Al Harper Collins another book, it feels different to people. But some people are not writing for that. They're writing because they have the need to write, because it's in their soul to write. I remember reading up uh, something that uh, James Baldwin said about how he would write on a paper bag when his mother would come home with groceries. He would tear it into uh, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, letter-sized shapes and, and write stories on it. Research, research, research. Because when you come in, like with anything, if you come in not knowing anything, it leaves you susceptible. Because there are sharks. And be realistic about it. 
Because I think, you know, we say, oh, I wrote a book. You know, I got the next bestseller. You know, this book is going to sell 20 mil. Yeah, I'm going to get rich. I'm going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. But what is our step-by-step plan for achieving this? You know, being realistic. What do I need to have in place? And more importantly, who do I need to have in place to achieve this, to bring this to fruition? You know, uh, and I think that that's why many of the writers are here. We want to be our own voice. We want to represent ourselves. In 2000, members of the African American Online Writers Guild met in Atlanta, Georgia. It was there that the Black Writers Reunion and Conference was born. Over the years, hundreds of aspiring self-published authors would come from around the world to attend the annual conference. Led by the founder, Tia Ross, the Black Writers Reunion and Conference would give birth to the dreams of those who sought a hands-on conference dedicated to the craft of writing and the business of publishing. I want to meet everybody that this is their first time, so I can tell them my first time story. The Black Writers Reunion and Conference filled a void by offering a professionally organized program of workshops and seminars presented by and for Black writers on the craft of creative writing, the business of publishing, book signings, and networking events. But it was a couple of days before my birthday. I had heard about it the year before when it was in Tampa, and I just couldn't afford it. So then I said, next year, I'm going. But 2012 would be the last Black Writers Reunion and Conference. So I wrote this poem for my friend. It's called My Rafiki, which means my friend in Swahili. So I wrote this poem and I read it to them. And they started crying. And then they said, well, we wanted to give you something, but you gave us something better. And they handed me a card. And in the card, I know it was about $500. They had all just gotten together and given me all this money to go to a conference, not even knowing if I could write. <laughs> and um, from that, I said, I'm going to go to this conference and I'm going to learn how to turn out a book because I want them to know that they sold in fertile ground, that I wasn't just going to take their money and not do anything with it. So when I went to Vegas, I had a mission. I was coming out of that conference with a book or how to do it or something. And when the book came out, I did. And I remember getting off the car and I picked up the phone. I called my husband. I was like, guess what happened? He's like, what? I said, I got laid off. It was silence. He's like, and that's a good thing? <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, it is. I'm like, trust me. I promise you. And that was it. The next morning, I got up, and for the next three weeks, three to four weeks, I got up every day, took my kids to babysitter, school, wherever they had to go, came back home and sat on my computer. I finished that book in three weeks. It's like I found my passion. And I didn't realize it was the passion until 2004 when everything happened, when I lost the, the job and started writing full time. But when, in retrospect, when I look back, hindsight, it had always been a passion because I'd always created opportunities for me to have to write. Even at work in my marketing jobs, I would create newsletters and start up new stuff that required for me to write. You know, if the budget got pulled back and I'm like, all right, we can fire the copywriters and I can do all the writing. You know, it was just always opportunities. Um, do you work full time? As of today, I still work full time. <laughs> But I turned in my notice on Monday, so soon I will be a, a writer full time, which doesn't really sound like a real job, but it is. That's a real job. And I have to start looking at it like writing is a real job. I had a sacrifice on my part to do the conference, to raise my boys and to work a day job and to stay in school because I'm, I'm still in school working on a degree, IT degree. And while we have a lot of people who offer to help out, it's, it, it's still a lot to manage everything. And I just got to the point that I wanted to stop micromanaging and stop 
multitasking so much and just focus on what I want to do next, next, the next stage. I was so grateful that I wanted to give back, but now who's going to be doing that? Like in this format, with this family that's been created, because I didn't understand why it was called Reunion. Like, what did that have to do with this conference? But after the first one, I got it. We're a family. We are really, really, really a literary family. My dreams of actually, you know, coming to a close of writing an actual book, um, it came from the Black Writers Conference. It, it came from being around other authors, other writers, and uh, I feel at home, I feel at peace, you know, with people that are like me. And so it's by accident that I connected with this group who's really provided me with an array of friends who are at different points in their writing journeys who have been able to provide invaluable tips. And that to me, when I see someone else who's done it, that's encouraging to me. That's, that's the thing, I wish that I had um, uh, known about this last year, well not last year, two years ago, as well as all the ones that preceded. I think it's awesome. It's given me a lot of information, a lot of insight, a lot of good information to use with, you know, my current writing experience, and has also um, opened my eyes up to the art of writing. And I wish that there would be another one because I would definitely come back. Yeah. People come to the conference and they're just maybe thinking about writing a book. They don't know if they have what it takes, and but it's something that they can't let go of. They just got this urge to write a book and they come to the conference and we just push them in that direction, give them what they need and help them get it done. And I would have to say just to have made that kind of effect, have that kind of effect on people is, is the, definitely the greatest legacy. But I think the idea of African-American writers coming together is powerful. They understand the twist and the turns and the good days and the bad days and the rejection letters and the not such great turnouts for the place. They understand that and they can empathize with you, they can encourage you, and what they can also do is when you start having too big a pity party, they can kick you in your butt. And tear. The other thing is knowing that the conference is coming in two years gives you a goal. So you know, I, I'm gonna have, I'm, I will have this done. Because when you get here, there's gonna be four or five people that remember you, remember your name, and remember what you said two years ago. And that accountability helps keep fire under your butt and keeps you moving. That I'll miss. Because it's not the same when you get in the space and you know they can see you and touch you. There are a lot of mamas here. You know what I mean? You wanna have your stuff together. Because they don't care about your excuses your job or your long hours. What they care is you said it, did you do it? And I don't know how to feel that, you know. I don't know how to feel that. Well, I'm, I'm really quite sad about that. I think I've attended four of them. And um, each one has been a different but unique and exciting experience. I mean, meeting new writers, um, talking to authors, being in an environment where you're, you know, inspired and encouraged, I think is a really important part of the process. And I think that we're losing something really valuable. What does success mean to you? How will you know you made it? New York Times is, is, is my personal marker, is the New York Times list. Whether it's at number 99 or ideally number one, I'm on the list. I'm happy. So that's my marker. Even when I was younger, I always dreamt of writing a book that the main idea of the book was not for a woman to find a man or a boyfriend. Like, I just was like, I know there's more to life for black women than trying to find a boyfriend. Like, I know there's something else. On a bigger scale from not just that, but I think if I see black women especially, I mean, obviously I want all women to feel this way and love themselves and all that, but I, if I can see some evidence of black women making a change towards loving themselves. I think that will be the mark of success. I hope that we're more conscious of other writers who may be reading our work, 
one day and hopefully they'll say, oh, Stacey Adams, she's one of my influences and I like her stuff because she respects her community and she respects who she is as a black woman. It looks like I'm red. That's what success, success looks like. And so for me, this is success. This is my dream because I refused to have that plan B. So I am a journalist, which is what I set out to do, and I am a published author. And I knew that if I believed in my dream, there would be no need for a backup plan. Now just because it worked for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you. I'm not telling you not to get a plan B because I don't need you coming looking for me talking about you said don't get a plan B. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is for me, I felt if I did not have a plan B, that would force me to make sure that my plan A worked. What makes you keep going? Because I have to. I do. I have to. Part of me feels like it has to work because I'm not just sacrificing for myself. But you know, I feel like that. I'm like, he sacrifices. He's kind of lost part of his mother while I chase this. And he just gives me a kiss and says, You could do it. Text me, high five. <laughs> What are you gonna miss? I'll miss the the the, fa the people, the faces, seeing everybody, the excitement when they get there, and then uh, seeing them come back with completed manuscripts and seeing their books in print. You showed me a picture one time of about six books written by people who attended the 09 conference in Vegas, and that was like the best thing ever.